Welcome to Grace Life Church. I'm David Kinneberg, one of the teaching elders here at Grace Life. We want to thank you for joining us online and listening to our sermons online. Hope they are a blessing and encouragement to you. If you want more information, you can check out our website at glcanoka.org. Thanks and God bless. Well, good morning. Good Sunday morning. Uh, you can turn to Revelation chapter 5. As a way of introduction, I want to ask for you to think Old testament if we can make up a word. I want us to go back and delve our minds and think of the book of Ruth. In the situation in the book of Ruth, you have Elimelech, Malion, Chilion, Naomi, in the time of the judges. And there's a famine that hits the land. Now, quite rationally and logically, but lacking of biblical faith, they sell what they have, and they go to the land of Moab. That was in disobedience and out of lack of faith. There are Moab, Elimelech, Malion, Chilion. Well, before that, Malion, Chilion, take of themselves wives of Moab. Again, something the Bible says don't do to the Jewish people. Elimelech, Malion, Chilion, die. And you have Naomi that's widowed in a land, a foreign land. And she goes back to Israel because that's, it makes sense. She goes back to, to Israel. At one point, her one daughter-in-law goes with her. The other daughter-in-law stays in Moab, and uh, Ruth, the one daughter-in-law that stays with her, has decided that Jehovah God was going to be her God. They get to Israel, and it's a struggle. Being a widow in Bible times was not a prosperous position to be, and they're living in subsistence, and Ruth finds Boaz, a near kinsman. And I'm not going to give all the details, but eventually Boaz, who is older than Ruth, but a single man, ends up being willing to be the kinsman redeemer. And without going to all the details of it, the kinsman redeemer has the right to purchase back. He, he could marry Ruth and purchase back the lost possession that Elimelech had sold in order for them to move to Moab. And there is a brilliant love story, but it's very easy to miss the picture that God is painting with the history of these individuals. And it's this whole history of redemption. God, going back to the garden, we have Adam and Eve. Through lack of faith and disobedience, they sell their birthright dominion and authority over God's creation and pledge humanity into sin. And God is working through history to bring about redemption. We come to the cross. Jesus Christ pays the price of redemption. When we come to the book of Revelation chapter 5, and I'll have to say one of the things it's easy to be guilty of is to come to the Bible and plummet for just systematic theology. What is the theology and what's the teaching? And that's good and it has its place. As I study in this, one of the things that, and I've taught through and been in the book of Revelation, and something that I've missed, and it's something that, I, to be honest with you, if we take that picture of Ruth and we apply it to what's going on here, I think our understanding and our picture of Revelation will be so much more powerful. Because Revelation chapter 5, as we get into it, and we'll read the verses here and we'll look at them in particular, it is a story of redemption. Now, we can think redemption is done. Okay, When Christ was on the cross, he says, it is finished. And it is. There's nothing I need to do to secure my salvation. There's nothing more I need to earn my salvation. It is finished. I have been redeemed. But God isn't finished with redemption. 
In fact, understanding dispensationally the history that is laid out in the Scripture. We have to understand it as an unfolding of redemption. Because there is a lot lost. It wasn't just the fellowship that we have with God that was lost at the fall. There's a whole bunch of things that were lost. Salvation is simple. A child can get it. A child can put their faith in Christ and be redeemed. But redemption is complicated because there's a lot of things that are still being brought back. In fact, we were talking in fellowship time, you know, the, the National Guard, Muffy sees National Guard as she's going into work and uh, just on the other side of the Crystal Airport is where all just on the other side of our neighborhood is where all the, the rioting and the looting and all of that has been going on. And we look at that. We say, oh, that's horrible. You know what that is? All of this is a depiction of the fact that God isn't finished with redeeming back everything that was lost. When we get in Revelation chapter 5, and by the way, we just sung a good portion of Revelation chapter 5. I, you will see that as we get in there. God is working out his redemptive plan. And it's exciting to think about. When we see the horrible ha things happen in the world, we go, oh, yuck. But God is at work redeeming back what was lost. Let's go to the Lord in word of prayer and then we'll jump into Revelation chapter 5. Dear Heavenly Father, as I come before you, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the fact that we can trust you and experience that personal redemption. But we thank you that it's not just that we were redeemed, we die and we go to heaven and then there's this endless process of of the evil that continues on in this world. But Lord, you are in the process of re redeeming not just individuals, but you're redeeming back all that was lost to mankind. Lord, I look forward to the day of redemption for which we are sealed unto. And Lord, I, I thank you that you're going to put evil down and it will be taken care of and we can live as you have designed for us to live. In Jesus' name, amen. So jumping in Revelation chapter 5, and again, we will not plumb the depths of every verse. There's 14 verses here, and we would be here for quite some time if we developed every thought that's in here. But we'll get the, the general understanding of this passage and hopefully the, the import that God wants us to have here. Now, we enter in and... Uh, Steve preached through Revelation chapter 4, so there's a lot of these things we won't have to develop. If you're here or if, you, if you've watched uh, the sermon, you'll have a lot of the details that are repeated here in Revelation chapter 5 you'll be familiar with. So we're not going to dive into some of those details. But Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, it starts off, Then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. So referring to God the Father, he's holding a scroll. Now we're not used to scrolls. We, we're we more used to the book forms. I do like scrolls whenever I have papers at work and I'm walking around, they all become scrolls. So uh, that fits for me. But uh, we have a scroll here. And it's easy to look at this just in the, the metaphor of uh, we think of the seals. Normally when I think of the seal judgments, and Revelation, I'm just thinking about how they're ending up into judgment. But we need to understand the picture of redemption that is here. The seal is a legal document. It's a legal document of what was lost to mankind. And normally we think of a, a scroll with one big waxy seal on it, and you open up the seal. The seal was designed for only the person that had the right to open it. This is the legal document. Normally you think of a scroll as having just written on one side. And you'd just you know, unfold it and you could read it and you'd fold it back up and it'd be covered up. This, the fact that this has writing on the inside and the outside describes it as a legal document. So if you'd imagine a, seat, a scroll 
and you would have a series, and it would be tapered down as you got to the different portions of the roll. And there's seven seals on it. And you could read. So the first seal, you could read what this portion of the seal was about. You rip open the seal, you would be able to find the details in it. And it's a legal document. Again, going back to things that are to be redeemed. This whole picture of Ruth and Boaz goes back to this whole idea of this picture of redemption, the seal of redemption. Someone had to have the ability, the right. You had to be able to pay the price of the things that needed to be redeemed. You had to have the position of authority. You had the position of relationship to open it. And the scroll is setting in the hand of God the Father. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals? Is there someone that is in a position, a near kinsman that can open these seals, that has the ability to pay the price? And no one in heaven or earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. Look at John's reaction. And we need to understand that in light of the fact of this as being redemption. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. Mankind is in trouble. And John knows the import of this. No one is worthy. We cannot go across the face of the earth we cannot find the best of mankind and find one person that has a right to redeem mankind. We're totally insufficient. There's not someone that has lived that has been an epitome of righteousness that could do this. And he is saddened because of that and he weeps loudly, uncontrollably. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll in its seven seals. That is exciting. Jesus Christ, the lion of Judah. By the way, uh, he's referred to as a lion here, and next he'll be referred to as a lamb. He has the right. He is worthy to open the scroll. He is our near kinsman. The fact that he became flesh for us gave him the right to redeem mankind and redeem everything that mankind had lost. He is worthy. Look what it says here. He has conquered. Something that's exciting about what Jesus Christ has done is that he has conquered. What has he conquered? There's three things that at least that Jesus Christ has conquered. First of all, he has conquered sin. When Christ died for us, he had fulfilled the law. There was not one speck of sin in Jesus Christ. He did not do any sin. And when he died on the cross, he paid for my sin. But beyond that, he paid for the sins of every single person that has ever occurred or ever will occur. He paid. He conquered sin. He also conquered death because he had no sin within him and he paid the price of sin he was able to conquer death because the sting of death is sin that is what has brought about death he paid for death he conquered death and the resurrection shows he was victorious there was no sin otherwise there would have been no resurrection we can be free from sin because Jesus Christ has conquered sin and death. But there's a third foe that he has conquered, and that was Satan himself. He put the prince, of power, uh, prince and power of the air, he put him to flight. He defeated him at the cross. He has conquered. And because Jesus Christ has conquered, he is worthy to open the scroll of redemption. Again, keep this in mind as we're looking at Revelation, that we're talking about redemption. It's easy when we think of these seals because we think of seals as judgment. 
Yes, there is going to be judgment that flows from this. And that is because the fact when Adam and Eve fell into sin, we relinquished our dominion and authority over creation. Now we have the prince and power of the air. Satan works in the hearts of men and women. He works in governments. He works in this world system. We look at the evil that happens and go, wow, that's horrible. Yes, and Satan is working that. But you know what? He has this power and authority not because he did anything to gain it. He's gained his power and authority in the world and over mankind by theft. So that's one reason why as God will open these seals, there is going to be judgment. He paid the price. He has bought back what needed to be redeemed. But the one, and by the way, the price wasn't paid to Satan. And that's an important thing to understand. But the one that has illegally possessed dominion and control over mankind is going to be put down. That is encouraging. Something to think of in understanding the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the last time that Satan has full and free reign. At the end of the millennial kingdom, he'll be loose for a season. But Satan is going to be put down during the tribulation period. At the end of the tribulation, he is going to be bound. Look at verse 6. In between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. That's an interesting picture. And I do not profess to understand all the significance of it. But the lion is also the lamb. This is a, a very big thing as we're going through the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ as the Lamb. And we, we can't forget that because again it alludes to the very fact that the book of Revelation is about redemption. And that is so much more exciting because we think of something, our, our language has, mis, uh, has abused the word apocalypse. Apocalypse means revelation. But in our language if you talk about an apocalyptic event you think of destruction and mayhem and that's so oftentimes even among us as bible believers we think of the disruption and mayhem that occurs in the book of revelation it's about redemption he stands with seven horns and with seven eyes which are the seven spears of god sent out into all the earth some of the the visual that we need to understand is in this passage we have God the Father setting, we have God the Son standing here, and we have the Holy Spirit. I believe this is what the seven spirits here that are being referenced is to the Holy Spirit in his fullness, in his work. The Trinity as it is, involved, is involved in this redemption of mankind. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, and when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls of, full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. I'm going to stop right there. Jesus Christ takes the scroll, and immediately what happens is there begins this great worship service. The 24 elders here, I believe, are indicative of the church. In the Old Testament, David took the Levitical priesthood and divided them into 24 groups. There's one group of individuals, and we'll see this in a moment, that have the combination of a kingship or royalty and priesthood that was divided in Israel. But in the church, that has been combined, and we'll see that in a moment. These elders are indicative or representative of the church. And they immediately fall down before the Lamb. And they begin worshiping Him. As we look at this and we see this beautiful scene of worship, we need to understand that worship is a very multifaceted thing that occurs and we'll even see this in this instance.
but one of the things that they have, and it's, it's an amazing thing, and it should encourage us here, is one of the things that they hold in their hands is a, a bowl full of incense. Now, a picture here, I don't know if you've ever burnt incense. That's not a very uh, common thing that we do, but uh, incense in the Old Testament was used to represent prayer. If you can imagine the bowl here full of incense, it's not little clumps of incense sitting in a bowl. It's a, a picture of a bowl full of smoke. And it would be full of smoke that would be having the sweet smelling savor to it. You know, we, we use Glade and we use uh, uh, Febreze and things to give us scent in our, our homes if we want, or we have candles. Maybe a candle would be a better representation of, for our mind here. You know, a scented candle. We love the smell of it. There's certain things and fragrances. So it's a description of something that is enjoyable or pleasurable. And who is it enjoyable and pleasurable to? To God, yes. Something that oftentimes when we come, and I, I think this is one of the importance of both uh, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 5. Sometimes we can get the idea that worship, okay, it's just something we can become perfunctory into it. And uh, our prayers, okay, what we pray, that's, that's great and wonderful. We don't understand the significance of our worship we don't understand the significance of our prayer because we forget what makes it significant. My prayers aren't significant because of who I am. My worship is not significant because of who I am. My prayer, my worship is significant because of who He is and the value that He places on those things. It is amazing to think that God values our prayer and finds it as something that he savors. Do we ever get tired of praying because, well, okay, what am I getting out of it? That's not the big import of prayer. Yes, God promises to answer prayer, and that's encouraging. And prayer isn't a give me, give me thing because I don't think God finds pleasure in those type of prayers. Though he does answer prayers that we ask in the right way that we were requesting for things. But those prayers that are done in an attitude of worship, God finds savoring. What an encouraging thing. So they bow down and they begin to worship him. By the way, you'll, you'll notice these, you just got through singing these words here. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. The theology that is in this song of worship is life-changing and encouraging. First of all, we look at Jesus Christ. Worthy are you to take the scroll. Uh, the word worthy there has the idea of weight and significance. He can do it. He has the power. He has the right. He, he has the near kinsman status because, again, he took on human flesh. And he was sinless. He can open the scroll. He can open the seals. For you were slain and by your blood. What has he done? You have ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. I, I do see a challenge. There's some that think revelation is something that has already occurred. And uh, if you're a preterist, you know, there's not a lot of stuff that you go to the book of Revelation for. But there is power in this. Think of this. We're in heaven here, and they're praising God because of what he has done. What is heaven going to look like? 
What is this time going to look like here? The very fact, and by the way, this wasn't a reality when John wrote this. But it is a reality now that from every tribe and language and people and nation, there has been people that have came to be children of God. He has ransomed them. He has bought them out of their sin. And look at verse 10. And have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on earth. There's three things here that are of significance. Made a kingdom. When you become a child of God, you become royalty. Wow. That's pretty encouraging. I have some applications to think of here in a moment. And priest. We have direct relationship with God. And one of the responsibilities, by the way, of a priest is to bring others to God. But we're a kingdom of priests. And what is our destiny? Our destiny is to reign on earth. Now we're going to go backwards here from the, the bottom of this. First of all, reigning on earth. When we look at the mess that the earth is in, could you imagine if you got rid of the consequences of sin? Do you know how expensive sin is? There would be no famines on earth if there was not sin. God has provided an earth that more than well provides for every single person that is here. Beyond that, the, people, the fact that people go to bed hungry and the fact that people are starving any place on the earth is a result of mankind's sinfulness. God has provided a plentiful world. You look at the chaos that's happening in our city. It's a result of sin. Could you imagine erasing that? The, the fact is, once... I, I have... Don't ask Muffy for details, please. But uh, I still sin. I know it's shocking. Le Leah, pick your job. I know that's surprise. There you go. It's, it's not so. You know, probably at least once every month. You know, uh, <laughs> that's not a joke. You know. Yes, it is a joke. We fail, we sin still, even though we've been redeemed. Stop nodding, Muffy. <laughs> it's that, that wearied look of, yeah, okay. We still deal with sin and. I wish it wasn't the case. I wish it was gone. One day it will be. I will not be able to sin anymore. Praise the Lord. I was getting ready for Muffy uh, to go, Amen! <laughs> you know, I won't be able to sin anymore. Once I die, once I have been glorified, there's no more sin. Now, could you imagine having an earth that those that are working in authority are sinless? Wow, that is going to be amazing. The world is going to flourish like it's never flourished before. That's exciting. They've made them a kingdom and priest or God. That position of royal priesthood is available to every single being. That was what the position that God had really set Adam and Eve up to be. And they lost it. Yet it's still available to every one of us. We live in a world that is suffering from an identity crisis. There's a lot of Christians that suffer from identity crisis. Because they do not know what God has called for them to be and will be. You ever get discouraged? You know, what am I doing in life? Uh, a lot of people struggle with the fact of insignificance. The very fact that Jesus Christ has ransomed me and has promised me a position of being a royal priest should set aside any identity crisis that I may face of. The more that we march away from God, I will guarantee you, the more we will see people that struggle with our, their identity. 
We are a royal priesthood, and I thank the Lord for that understanding. Look at verse 11. Then I looked and heard around the throne. Again, we just sang this. The living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. We're not going to break down all of that, but one of the first things I want us to look at is Jesus Christ isn't needful. It's not needful as the Lamb to receive these things. It's worthy as the Lamb. When it comes to who we are, and this is that idea of a complexity to worship, it's calling for something that is complete and full. But worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power, dunamis, power, the ability, wealth and wisdom, might, uh, the, the authority, and honor and glory and blessing. Jesus Christ is worthy of that because he was slain. He has fixed the problem of mankind. All we have yet to do is wait to see it fulfilled. And he is worthy of all these things. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and the sea and all that is in them saying, and again, we just got through singing that very short day ago. The whole earth is singing out to praise to God, uh, to God the Son here. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, both to God the Father and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. The word worship there is prasukamai, which means to be prostrate. We translate worship. Our English word worship means to declare as worthy. It's easy to think worship, okay. Whatever we accomplish, we come together on Sunday, we sing some songs, okay. Is that of any significance? Yes, it is. It's easy for some people to set aside, you know, okay, worship, that's a minor thing. But guess what? That is something that is going to be entailing a huge portion of what eternity is going to look like. So we're going to be busy worshiping the one that is worthy frankly when it comes down to this and we worship corporately we come together and there's this we see a corporate worship session here in heaven and that is valuable worship is something that is at the very key and nature of everything that we do as human beings now when he talks about worthy his idea of what are we valuing let me say one of the challenges that we have living here on our day-to-day -day existence is often our worship gets pointed to the wrong things. You know, we call that idolatry. The Bible calls it lust. The Bible calls it idolatry. We can desire after wrong things. Really, when he looks at this, these seven different things that Christ is worthy of, One of the things that we should look at in our life is as we're going about our existence. You know, I, I have a home, you know, I was even talking a little earlier. You know, I'd be willing to sell it right now if we didn't have animals all over the place and move to a town home where I didn't have to worry about, you know, the mowing and the fixing of the things. It's amazing. Things never stay fixed. You know. <laughs> Even not having three boys in the home, everything doesn't stay fixed. It has to be repaired every now and then. Just leave it alone a little while and see what happens to your house. Uh, they, they fall apart. But worthyship and worship for us as believers, we have the corporate time, and it's incredibly valuable. Our prayers together are highly valued by God. 
But the challenge for us now, before we have experienced that place of transformation and glorification, which I look forward to, is holding Christ in the proper position of worship. What does it mean that he is worthy of all these things, this glory and the riches and honor? Does it mean that I sell everything and I just have a shirt on my back and we wander around, we give everything to Jesus Christ and there's his. And we, we live in the dust. No. Worship for us means that everything that I have belongs to the Lord. You know, if that's why if it disappears and it's gone, and if we've really done that as worship, it's not going to be devastating to us. It won't destroy us because it's God's anyway. There's a challenge for us to worship God here. We look at Revelation chapter 5, and we've looked at all the verses. We haven't pulled everything apart that was in there. We see this great advent of this final act of redemption. Revelation going into the millennial kingdom. The whole book of Revelation is the final acts of redemption that is going on. I look forward to that. By the way, when we see the disasters that begin to unfold as Christ opens up the redemption and he opens up the seal, why is that going to be so disastrous? The fact is, as he is redeeming and he's bringing it back, there is some consequences to be paid. Satan is going to have to pay some consequences because, again, the authority that he's operating with is not justly derived authority. He is a thief. The Bible calls him a thief and a liar, and he is going to pay for that. The world system that is in opposition to God is going to have to pay for being in opposition to God. Jesus Christ can do that because he is the worthy judge. He was judged for our sins, and now he is the righteous judge. And he is going to stand in judgment. And it's sad to see the judgment, and we will see as we look in the book of Revelation, judgment being enacted. But it's part of the redemption process. One of the great things that we'll see as we look in Revelation is there's going to be thousands, there's going to be nations turned to the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. As we look at it, and we've looked at Revelation chapter 5, the encouraging thing is, two additional encouraging things here, is that Jesus Christ is worthy. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our time together here, worshiping. He's worthy of our time in prayer. God values those things. 